Welcome back to the channel. Today is the first video in a series that I am going to be doing species highlights on animals that are not only just native to this area, but animals that I have experience with breeding and keeping and acclimating. We're gonna go through a whole bunch of species, but in today's video, we are going to do one on Boiga cyanea green cat snakes. Now they're native here to our home base here in Thailand, and I've done a lot of work with them in the past, and so I wanna cover husbandry, breeding, acclimation, whatever, you name it. I was going to start filming this video tomorrow, and tonight we happen to have a green cat snake right here at our house. So we're gonna go ahead and give you guys some footage here of a wild Boiga cyanea that is taken up kind of like a position here on the rose bushes, Apple's rose bushes here. This one is a juvenile. It looks to be maybe, maybe better than a yearling, maybe a two year old or something like that. I have not disturbed it at all, but I am going to remove it from the rose bush to give you guys a much better look at it. It looks like it is still sort of turning into the green adult color. I still see some remnants of some orange colors. So let's see how this goes. They're usually not very bitey. I don't want to hurt it because these roses have thorns. Okay, now he, he or she thinks that my hand is food, like a lizard or something. So it's coming to investigate here. But let's see how if we can manipulate this animal gently. And I don't want to just grab it off the rose bushes, like I said, because there's a lot of thorns on here. Okay, here we go. Here it is, right here. It looks to be going into shed. It did rain today. It's very humid tonight. And yeah, so that's it. Very, very cool. Probably like a one and a half year old or something like that. <laughs> so great. So you guys, Boiga Cyanea, let's get into it. Let's go ahead and start giving you guys some of the um, natural history of these guys and our experience or my experience working with them and breeding them and that sort of thing. So I guess we could start with feeding. I grabbed a house gecko. We have thousands of them around our house and see if this one will take a house gecko. In the wild here, they're pretty much feeding on house geckos. Um, in captivity, we do sometimes do lizards, but for the most part, it's going to be rodents. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> There, how's that you guys? Hand feeding Boiga cyanea in my driveway. <laughs> that is cool. So these snakes are rear fang. Basically means they have an enlarged, enlarged teeth in the towards the rear of their mouth, kind of underneath the eye. Different rear fang snakes will have those teeth positioned forward or directly under or sometimes to the rear of the eye. They do have a venom gland, but the delivery system is actually quite inefficient. So what they do is they'll utilize that enlarged tooth with a chewing motion, and that will basically allow some of the toxin that kind of naturally seeps into their saliva to gain access into the wound that they're creating with that rear fang. The uh, toxin is basically evolved to affect you know either small mammals or other reptiles and it's just basically aids in uh, subduing food and digesting food and that sort of thing. Boiga are usually are going to do exactly what this snake is doing here grab its food swallow it down live pretty much not really waste any time but a perfect example of what Boiga cyanea 
are going to eat in the wild. They love house geckos. They hang, the snakes actually do hang around our house. And like I said, we have many, many house geckos living all around here. So it may be sad for some of you to witness this, but uh, this is just nature, just kind of taking its course right here at our house. So you're gonna find green cat snakes in India, China, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and Malaysia. Now, you are not going to find wild-caught cyanea in the pet trade. It is pretty much going to be limited to captive bred only from US breeders and European breeders. And if I had to guess, knowing what I know about the uh, details of import-export, probably the most likely origin for the animals that are being bred in the hobby right now is going to be Malaysia, I would have to say. Now, Boiga cyanea are an arboreal snake. You're gonna find them basically in a forest exactly like where I'm at right now. In fact, we have found cyanea in this exact forest. As adults, they're going to reach six to seven feet. They're going to be green in color. Occasionally, you may come across one that is like a kind of a silvery color or like just sort of a muted green color, but bright green is pretty much the adult coloration. Babies are going to be hatching out like a red, pink, or orange color with a green head. And usually by the time they're about two years old, they're going to be green. The other interesting thing that I've noticed is that the adults have a black color inside to their mouths and the babies are just like a normal pink flesh color. And so with the adults, when they do like a defensive gape, it's pretty intimidating staring at a black mouth. It's quite different. So in the wild, these are going to eat other snakes, lizards, geckos, frogs, rodents, and birds, and even bird eggs. I will put a link to a video that we did last year where we found a Boiga cyanea that actually ate a bunch of chicken eggs, which was pretty crazy. My opinion is that being that the Boiga cyanea are nocturnal, they're going to be cruising around up in here in these trees. And at night, the diurnal snakes like the bronzebacks and the flying snakes, they're going to be sleeping up high in these trees. That's when the Boiga are out hunting, so it's really easy for them to encounter a sleeping snake and probably get a good grab on it, get the take advantage of the difference between nocturnal and diurnal, but they will eat each other. Now breeding in nature, there are basically two seasons. So they have two breeding seasons. One is in July for egg laying and the other is in January. And this is in relation to the various rainy seasons here. In captivity, they will also double clutch and it just depends on if you're feeding them enough, if you're manipulating things correctly and just if you're just lucky of course that's the biggest factor with captive breeding it seems now for breeding these i'm not a big fan of temperature cycling my snake rooms are going to always have a nighttime drop and the nighttime drop is going to be a bit more extreme based on the time of year so in the winter time when it's colder outside my nighttime drop is a little bit more and then in the summertime when things are warmer outside my snake rooms are going to maintain a bit higher ambient at night, but I always have the temperature drops at night. I feel that that's pretty important. It's key. Um, I mean, that's what happens in nature, right? So that's what I try to follow. Now there is a wide range of temperatures that you can incubate eggs at. And obviously the warmer you do it, the shorter the duration and the cooler that you do it, the longer the duration. So you're looking at anywhere between 85 and like 110 days incubation in captivity. And for me personally, I prefer to incubate at the lower temperature 
maybe like 82 or 83 and I just wait out the days. So it might be 110 days until pipping and maybe add an extra five to seven days on top of that for uh, actually leaving the egg. But it's just safer for me. I feel always better to incubate all of my snake eggs at lower temperatures and I just am patient and wait it out. So beyond that, I just let the animals kind of tell me what they're up to based on how they're acting, where they're sleeping, if they're hugging heat, if they're away from heat and all that sort of thing. I will feel for follicles in the females. That tells me exactly where that female is going to be at in terms of reproduction. When I feel follicles, I know that it's time to start doing introductions with a male and also time to start feeding her heavy if she will feed. Usually they will feed up until ovulation and then kind of pretty much go off food at that point. But feeling for follicles is key. And as I said before, these snakes will prey upon each other. So I personally have never lost a boiga to cannibalism, but by using the method of feeling for follicles, that tells me when the female is receptive towards breeding. Now, if you don't know how to do that, you're going to be putting animals together for breeding just at random times of the year. And if your female is not receptive, that is a really good time to lose your male. Male's usually gonna be the smaller one, and usually it's the male that gets eaten. So you have to be careful of that. But for me, I feel pretty good with feeling for follicles. Never lost a male. I feel those follicles being developed. Put the male in there, usually super receptive for breeding. Feed the female real heavy. Make sure she has enough uh, nutrition to go the distance, enough body fat and all that, and good to go. Now, establishing babies is something I would consider a bit more advanced compared to your more mainstream animals. Uh, a lot of times you will have to use scenting techniques, uh, assist feeding and that sort of thing. It is not that big of a deal if you're experienced and you've done it before, but it can be a little bit labor intensive. You have to be patient and eventually almost all of those animals are gonna kick in and do their thing. And most of the time, you're looking at a very high success rate getting captive animals to feed on rodents. Whether or not it is the, the best diet, probably not. I still believe in a varied diet. So I personally will do frozen thawed quail, uh, frozen thawed chicken chicks for the adults. And you can also do frozen thawed house geckos to remove the possibility of any sort of parasite issues. So that is pretty much how I do it. Um, had a lot of success in doing so. So that is gonna do it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, if you learned anything from it, let me know in the comments below. Give the video a like, subscribe to the channel if you want. We have a lot more of these types of videos coming out in the very near future. I am only gonna do these videos for species that I have personal experience with and I feel that I'm pretty well versed in. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm an expert and give you videos on animals that I've never worked with. That seems to be the trend nowadays on YouTube, but DM Exotics is not going to be going that route, not even close. So thank you so much for watching you guys. Be safe and we will see you in the next one. Take care.